Stand by to receive our transmission. Transfer complete. This is Lieutenant Commander Leo Rozek of the USS Astraeus. Happy 25 years, Starbase 118! This month, we celebrate 25 years of our beloved community. What makes this month even more special is the awards ceremony. Here are your fleet announcements for the first podcast of 2396. Awards nominations are closed, and the fleet staff have reviewed your nominations and compiled a list of winners. The ceremony will run through June 30th, and a list of winners will be posted in the awards ceremonies thread in the Hall of Honor on the forums. A hearty congratulations to the following fleet staff on their promotions. Alexander Williams and Jared Thorin to Commander. Mekonda and Otis Aria to Captain. Roshanar Rahman, Sal Tabram, and Jelana Rajel to Fleet Captain, and our beloved Quinn Reynolds to Vice Admiral. Hello, everyone. I'm Jesse. I play in Lieutenant Chloe Waters. You're listening to the podcast team. You're listening to the podcast team Montreal in Focus segment. I'm here with the writer be- behind Captain May, be- Captain Myconda. So tell us, the Asterius will be the newest ship in the fleet. What do you see the advantages and disadvantages of this being? Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the Astraeus is a new ship in the fleet, even though in universe it's a little on the old side, a little long up too. Um, beginning new play on a new ship can always be a little uncertain because you don't know exactly how people are going to respond to it. As you know, Starbase 118 is a little different than tabletop RPGs because while the captain and first officer may in some way be the closest equivalent of a dungeon master from Dungeons and Dragons, every player on your ship plays that part to a degree in terms of driving the plot forward and deciding what happens to their characters. Because of that, I've found it important and invaluable to find out what my players are interested in doing, designing missions around those themes. The Astraeus hasn't actually launched yet. We're just about to do that, but we're currently on shore leave, so we'll see how that all works out once we're out on the mission. Indeed, well, I wish you the best of luck, so... Thank you. Your previous ship, the Montreal, was recently destroyed. What do you believe your favorite moment has been during the Montreal's run, and why? Montreal was a, a great ship, but... It was sort of unique in in that it was one of the few Federation designs that was able to land. Um, And that came into some of our favorite missions. Uh, My concept for the Montreal was that our time on her would always be limited. Her destruction was meant to be the prologue to the Astraeus' launch. My favorite moment that involved landing was a mission which one of the Federation colonies in the Shoals was attracted by bioweapons, and the Montreal landed in order to serve as a mobile field hospital. And that ended up providing some interesting play that I don't found on that type of ship. Oh, that's quite interesting, actually. You could give the Astraeus one single defining feature to separate it from the rest of the fleet. What would that feature be, and why? Uh, like I said earlier, I uh, tend to prefer older ships. They have a little more character, a little history. Uh, so I decided to make the Astraeus one of the first galaxy class ships that was built alongside other ships like the Galaxy prototype. Uh, in our timeline, that puts her at just over 30 years old, and she's just completed her first major refit. I found it uh, really enjoyable to write up the ship's history. 2360s all the way up to our current year, 2396. And to that end, I commissioned some 3D artists to do some exterior and interior pictures of her in order to give people a visual idea of the changes. And I think that helps it to stand out. 
I, think, I, I can imagine that uh, writing 30 years of a Starship history must be a difficult task. To some extent, but it was also a lot of fun. Uh, that's, Did, that's the sort of fiction I really like to uh, uh, dig my teeth. Did you, did you do it all on your own, or did you have any help? Every once in a while, I uh, checked in with Evan Delano's writer, Cameron, to see if he had any ideas for it. Uh, he provided some contribution here and there, but it was mostly me. Oh, nice. Where do you see the Astraeus in one year's time? Well, uh, myself and my senior staff have come up with an idea for a campaign region that is in proximity of real universe Eagle Nebula. If you've ever heard of the Pillars of Creation, that's where those exist. And we have some new races in mind, technologies, problems for the Astraeus' crew to overcome. And I'm really hoping that the Astraeus' crew enjoys that um, change of pace that comes with being on a long-term exploration mission instead of a more uh, mission-driven day-by-day sort of Montreal. Can you describe the mission that stood out to you most during your course as CEO of the Montreal? What made it stand out to you so much? Uh, that would probably be the Montreal's final mission, which we just finished a few days ago. Uh, during that, a lot of loose ends that have been established over Conda's career and Montreal's were tied up. We had a recurring villain, a crazed Vulcan terrorist named Lennox, who showed up every few missions to cause a whole lot of damage in the shoals. Uh, during this final mission, the Montreal was disabled. And the only way to stop and ram this ship into a Federation colony was to self-destruct Montreal and destroy both vessels in the process. Uh, Lennox was killed in a pretty cool showdown by members of my crew during this time. To me, it felt like a great ending to what was essentially a season-long arc of chasing the sky down. And I thought it was a great wrap-up for the time on the Montreal that we spent together. That sounds like a lot of fun. What do you like consider it. to... Oh, no, go ahead. I liked it a lot. All right. What do you consider to be the greatest threat of the crew that writes behind you? And why? That is, that is a tough one because everyone has so many different skills. Um, I do feel extremely lucky to have the crew that I have. Some are great at characterization, like uh, writing characters with a unique, distinct voice. Um, some are really good at driving the plot forward and giving other players things to do. Um, but overall, I would say that I think the crew's greatest strength is enthusiasm. There is only so much credit I can take for driving the plot as the ship commander. There have been a lot of really great elements that have been introduced by the crew of the Montreal and now the Estrellas. It makes my life so much easier. <laughs> All right, what has your favorite part of leading this group of writers been, and why? Well, it's a little bit of selfish pleasure, to be sure, since I uh, worked hard to get to this point. Starbase 118 has what I think are probably the most stringent requirements to reach captaincy of any get. And it has a lot of work and time involved that dissuades some people. But as far as I'm concerned, it makes the reward of finally getting to that point all the much sweeter. Uh, my writers are aware of that fact. And I believe that there's a level of respect that they offer me that I feel privileged to receive that I probably wouldn't be getting if I don't be doing this for six months. So yeah. that's, uh, that's probably why. Yeah, and I would agree with that. It's not a, it's not only the uh, it's not only the reward that it brings you when you get to that point where you are now. I think it's also the um, the the knowledge that oh my god, I've started this tiny little ensign, and now look at me running a ship of my own. That is definitely a big part of the appeal. Yeah. I started as an ensign before we were using Google Groups, but if I look really carefully, I can still go back and. Yahoo groups and seek out some of those really old Ensign Maconda Sims, which are always kind of funny. Oh, yeah. It is always really interesting to see, holy crap, I used to write this way? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> well, 
This has been the Montreal in Focus with Captain Mykon. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you, Captain Mykonda. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I'm Jesse as Chloe Waters signing off. Hi, my name is Commander Kelber from the USS Veritas. We have been fortunate to add several new officers to our ranks these last several months and seen some familiar faces return. Please give a warm welcome to January Solok of the USS Montreal, Chloe Waters of the USS Eagle, Steny of the USS Montreal, Blade Bescotti of the USS Eagle, and February Arika Jezovic Collins of the USS Constitution B, Ronen R of the USS Veritas, Bel Carena of the USS Columbia, Ben Garcia of the Embassy at Duronis II, Addison McKenzie of the USS Veritas, Steven Matrix of the Starbase 118 Ops, Carmen Tis of the USS Gorkon, Gwen Dina of the Embassy of Duronis II, Thailand Daru of the Embassy of Duronis II, March, Krau Chukir Grolo of the USS Constitution B. In the month of April, Sakin of the Embassy of Ronis II, Navina Abu El Saji of the USS Veritas, Charlena Bandis of the USS Veritas, Andy Monroe of the USS Veritas, Karen Stendhal of the USS Columbia. Ambrosia Haley of the USS Eagle. On the month of May, Rao Hontru of the USS Eagle. Damir Io of the USS Eagle. Kras of the USS Constitution B. Kirha Terin of the USS Gorkot. Finally, on the month of June, Kaitriona Kane of the USS Gorkon. Thanks to a wonderful training team for all of their efforts these last couple of months. Welcome to the fleet and see. This is Lieutenant Commander Lael Rozak with the What's New with the Fleet segment. USS Eagle crew enjoy shore leave promotion of officers. Starbase 281. In the aftermath of the disastrous first contact with the social group known as the People, the USS Eagle, NCC-74659, returned to Starbase 281 for a much-needed period of shore leave. Despite, or indeed because of, the dangerous and stressful conditions of their previous engagement, most of the crew were especially receptive to the downtime. Some of the staff elected to return home, such as Commander Otis Arya, who visited her world of Bajor to participate in a light ship race. Others chose to investigate the amenities offered by Starbase 281. The rest, primarily engineering staff, remained aboard the Eagle to conduct relevant repairs, but mainly to assist in the installation of a prototype Warp 15 core, a process primarily executed by members of the Advanced Starship Design Bureau. USS Montreal destroyed over Caraca. Caraca, Shoals. Following the destruction of the USS Montreal, NCC 64927, the crew was transported to Star Station Esperance, where they remained for the duration of Commander Maconda's court martial. The proceedings spanned a couple of days to allow for a thorough investigation of the circumstances surrounding the vessel's demise. It's standard procedure, commented JAG Officer Lieutenant Commander Timothy Joseph. It's not every day starships get blown to bits in the line of duty. Most hostages from the freighter USS Belfast boarded transports to other locations upon reaching Esperance, in hopes of putting some distance between themselves and the painful memories of loved ones lost. Some, however, have elected to remain with the Montreal crew and plan to join them as civilians aboard their new assignment, the USS Astraeus. Ancient Ruins Discovered by USS Columbia Sagittarius Reach 
Strange happenings have been reported aboard the USS Columbia in the aftermath of uncovering energy readings emanating from a recently discovered planet. The USS Columbia NCC-85279 has spent the past few weeks beyond Losarian space investigating a newly discovered M-class world. The planet, which as of writing remains unnamed, was identified by a long-range probe after detecting intermittent energy readings. As attentive readers may recall that we previously stated there were reports of the runes on the surface of the planet. We were able to confirm that they were, indeed, runes located on the surface, explained Lieutenant Bill Foy Gernart, an archaeologist, who went on to say, Unsubstantiated reports from the surface team have indicated the presence of an ancient alien starship below the surface. When asked for a comment on the reports, both Starfleet Command and the Federation Science Council refused to comment, adding fuel to the speculations. Space, the final frontier. Four iconic words that have become an indelible part of our culture for decades. They evoke a plethora of emotion and sentiment in a great many people. To boldly go where no one has gone before. This is a phrase that ignites the imagination and fuels the curious nature of our species. Star Trek has left a mark on our culture and indeed our entire world. From inspiring advances in technology or generations of scientists, leaders, and explorers, as well as engaging our creative spirit. That inspiration and engagement has led to countless novels, films, fan art, fan fiction, and more. A utopian-esque universe beloved by us all, and that which inspired a certain individual to create, explore the creative side and go boldly. In 1994, Star Trek The Next Generation was seeing its final season come to a close. That same year, Starbase 118 was founded on America Online, at a time when one had to pay for time on the internet, a time referred to as old, though we try not to speak of this dark time that much. <laughs> it's my humble honor to present to you a few of the historical highlights from the long, expansive history of this beloved community of writers we were part of. That being said, at one point, Starbase 118 shifted from America Online to email, Good call, I say, especially with the inevitability of growth within the fleet. As time went on, the various members of Starbase 118 let their creativity soar. Two years after its founding, Starbase 118 had its first summer blockbuster. No, they didn't make a movie. I'm, of course, referring to something quite different, yet no less cool. As they were fleet-wide events that required a great deal of in-character and out-of-character involvement. The first one dubbed the Yolanda Wars, was an armed conflict between the Federation and the Romulan Empire over the disappearance of the USS Yolanda. Since then, there have been a total of 10 blockbusters. The last one ended back in 2016, or star date 2393. However, there's no doubt a vast difference between the first and last blockbuster as the size of the fleet no doubt made the Shadow Wars, the final blockbuster to date, a logistical nightmare. And yet, members of Starbase 118 pulled it off each time, leaving an important mark on the canon of our community. Eventually, as with all things, they grow large enough that it requires a bit more work in governing them. Originally, the PBEM group we all know and love now is much smaller, far cry from the fleet of ships and bases that we know and love. Yet, as it is with all this, it grew in size, so much so that on Stardate 237712.17, the United Federation of Planets Constitution was drafted. That's December 17th, 2000, for those not fluent in our IC chronology. It laid out the groundwork for how Starbase 118 was to be governed going forward. A couple of years later, the fleet came together in a massive project that was the creation of the Embassy of Dronus II and an entire canonical species, the Laudians. This grand undertaking saw the fleet come together to create that species along with a new ship for the fleet. I am, of course, referring to the NBC itself. This was no doubt more of a task than the summer of blockbusters. That, however, was not the first fleet-wide event. That honor belonged to the United Federation of Planets Awards Ceremony. Established in 1996, this fun annual event gives the command staff of the group a means of honoring and rewarding the other members of the fleet for the dedication to the fleet. 
with everyone on each ship able to put forth nominations for the peers for various awards, each award can only be won by a member once, and the command staff make a final determination after all the nominations have been received and announce the winners. It's an exciting and fun time of year as every ship and crew in the fleet get a chance to cheer on their fellow simmers. A few years after the creation of the Constitution, the wiki was founded. March 2004 saw the launch of our wiki, and with it the broadening of our community as it now allowed writers to not only create and shed the detailed profiles for the characters, but became a repository for all of Starbase 118's collected history, and more. Although, that being said, the wiki was not the first such database used for 118. The UPDS, United Federation of Planets Personal Database System, was the first simming group interactive online member database, and according to Admiral Wolf, it's been retired for quite a long time. Still, I'm sure its existence paved the way for the wiki we all know and love now. Starbase 118 also has ver various out-of-character departments, if you will, that see to the successful operation and continued expansion of our grand community of writers. Among them are the podcast team, image collective, media relations, training team, and Federation News Service. The podcast team, for example, Collaborate together to bring you such wonderful tidbits such as this that you're listening to now. The training team are varied and growing as the needs of the fleet rise, but many are likely no stranger to us all. They are tasked with the administration of the Starbase 118 Academy, and the team works in rotation as needed where each member is able to act as CO, FO, or commanding officer, first officer, and even mock cadets for our incoming hopefuls. The more recent addition... Starbase 118 is the Federation News Service, or FNS. The wonderfully creative souls behind this team diligently work on bringing stories set within our canonical universe. Everything from reports of tog hunts to fashion shows, the stories that they create add to the canon of our universe. All this being said, it's no surprise that over the last 25 years, Starbase 118 has had a marked impact on the simming and role-playing community. To the point that the internet community at large has even presented a few awards to Starbase 118 over the last several years. In addition to being recognized with various awards, the fleet has shown its longevity and how long some of its members, aside from Wolf, have been active in the fleet. Fleet Captain Roshanar Rahman has been around for the past seven years. And then there's Admiral, Rear Admiral Tony Turner and Vice Admiral Quinn Reynolds, who've been with Starbase 118 since 2005 and 2007, respectively. There's also been several members of the fleet over the years that have left for various reasons, only to return years later. You may have chatted with a few of them from time to time on Discord. Well, not everyone in the fleet has a Discord, the chat program certainly brings us closer and connects us all a bit more in real time. Especially with the monthly fleet chats where each ship is highlighted and members of the crew, where available, give a brief recap of what's going on in their little piece of the grander scheme. The Discord has expanded recently with more channels for everything from general Star Trek discussions to dedicated ship channels and voice chat. Listen at the risk of your sanity, however. These past 25 years, man, it's a whole quarter of a century that Starbase 118 has had an impact on the broader internet simming community, while some, like myself, have only had the honor of participating for a brief period of time. It's a humbling and awe-inspiring thing. Whether you've been here since the beginning, many, many years, or only just graduated from the Academy, or anything in between, here's hoping for another 25 years of wanted storytelling. To read the entire article that I've been reading from, please check the Federation News Service's website sometime in the near future. This is Lieutenant Commander Torin Raga, signing off. Hello there. My name is Rich, I play for Fleet Captain Roshanara Rahman, and today I'm going to be talking with one Lieutenant Jeffrey Teller, who plays the Chief Engineer of the USS Veritas. Hello there, Jeffrey. Captain, it's uh, good to talk to you in person, of course. Uh, you know, hopefully I won't get busted down to cadet again. <laughs> well, you know, I, I just called you Jeffrey there, but Rahman never actually calls you that. Uh, she tends to call you Mr. Teller. That, that is true. Uh, but why don't you, for those who don't know you, uh, just go ahead and give us a little, as much as you want, or as little, background about uh, who you are and how you came to 118. 
Sure. Uh, as uh, the good fleet captain mentioned, uh, the character I play is uh, Lieutenant Jeffrey Teller, who has been the uh, chief engineer on the Veritas uh, for about seven months now, I believe. Uh, I my, my actual name is Brian, and I joined Starbase 118, uh, I believe, late last year, uh, late September, early October, uh, and after finding it through a uh, Reddit post. And wow. I was uh, very interested in uh, the the idea of the creative writing aspect of it, and I've always been a uh, an enormous uh, fan of Star Trek. So that, coupled with the the uh, my enjoyment of creative writing, really uh, made it very interesting. Uh, so I I signed up for the academy almost immediately after reading through the post, and uh, it's kind of all been downhill yep. from there i mean if, if i'm honest you know it's just it's been one major explosion after another uh, mm -hmm, sure you kind of just you uh what do they call it? you failed your way into a department chief or uh, you, you know failed upwards failed upwards yes yes you know the peter principle at work here 21st <laughs> century oh so i didn't know that though you were part of the uh, reddit influx that we had last year yes because there was uh, a post or two i think that you know, yeah, I, had to, oh, go ahead. I used to be a, uh, uh, well, I actually I still am, uh, a contributor to uh, the writing prompts uh, subreddit. And I always found uh, that kind of short form fiction to be good kind of creative and mental exercise. Uh, but I found, uh, especially over time, that the prompts were getting extremely repetitive and very derivative in some cases where it, things were just getting dull and the the interest in the story writing for me was was kind of waning uh so when i heard about kind of what's what starbase 118 was all about that sounded much more uh, well, if active is quite the right word, but engaging certainly. Yeah, like and, uh, it has giving you material, that. right? Certainly oh, absolutely, and the, the collaborative <laughs> aspect of it was uh, was very appealing. Yeah, I was just so that I was about to ask you: Is this your first uh, plane experience? Whether yes. Star Trek or anything. Well, it's my first uh, play by email collaboration uh, experience like this. Uh, I have played. Uh, a number of you know other RPGs and stuff like that, tabletop, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, you name it. I've uh, I've probably spent some time with it, and I've done uh, some DMing in my time as well, and I've always enjoyed that. But it's uh, like, and I, I think this is a struggle for uh, a lot of people who play those kind of games. Uh, getting the the time as you get older with you know, a group of friends to get together and dedicate to that kind of immersive and experience. It's very, very difficult. Uh, so the, uh, the online nature of 118 and the kind of continuous flow of it, uh, really appealed to me and, and has kept me engaged ever since. All right. Well, that's, that's great to hear. I guess, uh, for those listening that maybe, you know, uh, people who've joined since you or even just you know people who are looking for advice because i certainly consider you one of our strongest writers especially for a new member hey thanks gab yeah uh <laughs> so what advice would you give someone maybe uh, whether someone who's just kind of thinking of joining or you know i've never done it playing or even someone as a writer as you said you, you used to writing prompts and stuff. uh what advice would you give in in general let's just we'll start there just to how, how you approach maybe uh, how you tackle story writing in one way hmm. well so uh, as far as advice for story writing um it's uh, a lot of a lot of what i've learned over the years has been to truly keep things simple and honest wherever you can speak from you know it's not just about write what you know but write 
honestly about whatever subject matter that you're covering, even if you're contextualizing it in a, you know, fun, fantastical science fiction universe. Um, I'm trying to remember. Let's see. I get what you're saying, though, because obviously it's funny to kind of say, write what you know, and you know, you're usually writing about the 24th century, you're doing a lot of techno babble, or uh, you're writing about alien species and stuff like that, that you have my firsthand knowledge, but you approach that, uh, at least the way I do, and I'm sure you assume it too, is that you still have your character's reactions be honest to whatever it is you place yourself there. To- Absolutely. And, and the, the, the quote that I was looking I've I felt that this has informed to to its benefit my, a lot of my other writing. And I try to always keep it in mind uh, when working on uh, one one eight stuff. Um, Hemingway is a, a, a literary icon, and he's you know a, a titan in the field. And he once said that no subject is terrible if the story is true. If the prose is clean and honest, and if it affirms courage and grace under pressure, it's such a simple phrase, but it delivers so much meaning to what makes a, what makes literature stand apart from a hastily scrawled story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like what when people talk about story really having an impact really staying with following those in some ways like you said just simple goals and yet uh, it makes that huge difference for your product so so back to your um back to your original question and kind of some of the younger writers uh something that i've seen even in my time uh, aboard the ship is some of the new writers that come in aren't confident about expressing negative uh, emotions, um, awkwardness, discomfort, uh, fear, um, uh, nervousness. They don't feel that they can put that in a story because they're concerned that it's going to disrupt the sim or affect the other writer's fun or good times. And I, I've regularly told them, no, that's, that's fine. If that's what you think the character is feeling. If the, if you honestly feel that that character in that situation is stressed or is nervous or is awkward or is uncomfortable, well, then write with that, use that, make that part of who that character is, but do so honestly. Don't make it needlessly wacky or needlessly uh, obtuse. If that person's nervous because it's their first day on the job, let them be nervous because they're, that's their first day on the job. That's, that's a very accessible thing to a lot of people. And it may not seem Star trek but that doesn't matter. It's about having an articulate character. And the universe around you is so vast and so all-encompassing that that's how you add richness to it, by bringing this new character's life into this fantastical universe. Yeah, exactly. And I would say it's not only is it real, that's actually a great starting point then for future character development. Absolutely. Yeah. And you can, yeah. it's, a, it's a great way to from a clean slate, develop a character and show them growing in their roles, show their confidence growing. Or even if not, some, there there are canonical examples of characters who have not been confident. Uh, Reg Barkley is a famous example of someone who had zero confidence and was horrendously socially awkward, but he was extremely great at his job. And yeah. as soon as he could find a way to work with the people around him. And as soon as the people around him found a way to work with him, everyone benefited. And that's Star Trek all over. Well, and I would say that when you look at the Star Trek characters that are younger or fresh out of the Academy, of him, or you think of uh, Cadet Tilly, or you think of uh, Bashir when he first started, right? He was very eager 
Um, a lot of the times our characters are, when they get on a ship, it's be- they, we have them that they're new ensigns. So I think it's perfectly natural that they're in that state, maybe compared to when you say like Star Trek, because when you think of like people like Kirk, Riker or something, these are characters that are actually better in Star Trek officers when they first meet them in the shows. Um, and th- and that's something I think if you're interested later in doing that because I know this is one thing I have to experience my when I changed player characters for example Mon when she was introduced by that point I was already a leader and I introduced her that she was experienced officer so certainly she might have initial um, anxiety at a, a, fre- a fresh new entity but um, yeah I would I would say that's perfectly in line. So let's let's talk about your character then, sure. uh, his journey so far. Can you tell me a little bit about how Jeffrey Teller, the concept of this character, where it came? Well, I uh, well uh, Jeff Teller, in a way, was a, a response to some of the things that I I feel are bad habits in not just Star Trek, but in in science fiction in general where you create a super character who is uh, some elements of fantasy fulfillment for the writer and some elements of uh, kind of like bad RPG playing where you want to put all your stats to 100 right away. You want to make the the coolest, suavest, most charming, most genius, most martial art gun shootingest spaceship flying as person ever and they're just the best at everything all the time and i wanted someone who was human i wanted are someone who you, are was you, are you saying you specifically nerfed your character not nerfed <laughs> but i didn't go out of my <laughs> way to superpower him mm-hmm. uh i wanted someone who was not perfect someone who could have flaws but still be good at their job and still bring something to the people around them without just being a superstar all the time he's good at some things he's not good at others uh you have commented on his judgment from time to time uh but i think those are elements that add richness to the character and his interactions with other characters where some of the kind of uber characters that i've i've run across they can kind of be bland to sim with because they've got a solution to every problem right on their pocket and that's just kind of boring to me at least so for people who don't sim with you uh, maybe you can uh, describe a little bit jeffrey why don't you go ahead and uh, maybe just pick one. What would be like one weakness that you feel like Jeffrey dealing with, or well, that, he has um, that maybe you would want to work on, or that just is part of his character? That you- sure. Well, um, uh, Teller is uh, almost dangerously self-sacrificing. Uh, he in his in his backstory, he lost his family uh, when he was in his twenties. Uh, his mother and father were killed in a, a transport accident, and it impacted him very deeply and and affected his concept of family. And that's something that he brought with him when he joins. He's very much looking for. Uh, uh, I don't want to say a surrogate family, but he's certainly, there's an element of that in his mind where the people that he's with, the crew that's around him, they have become very central to his life and he would do literally anything to protect them. But that is to his detriment. And in an early sim that I wrote, it very nearly got him killed uh, and would have been justified in doing so if it had happened. Uh, and as a kind of reminder of that for the character, I had him suffer an injury at the time that then left him with kind of some lingering psychological issues that I've gone back to a few times with our ship's counselors and with some of the other characters as this has had an impact on Teller. And this is part of how he has developed as a person since joining the ship. 
Yeah, certainly. And I guess, you know, when we come in with uh, an idea of our characters, sometimes it changes because of uh, maybe just how the story affects the character, or even a lot of times how other people react to our character or give us prompts to make us think about something that we realize maybe our character go a certain way. What is something that maybe you had vision in Taylor, or, or not even, just something that has surprised you that you've learned about Taylor, or that you know, you've taken the character in this direction since you joined? Like when you look back now and you're like, wow, I never thought Taylor was this kind of person or this aspect of him develop. Uh, well, uh, something, something that's definitely interesting to me about because of, uh, because of the way things uh, shook out in the fleet, he very quickly went from uh, a junior engineering officer to being the chief engineer of the ship. And I had not anticipated that kind of a, I want to say command advancement when I originally envisioned the character more expected him to kind of be working under someone else for a period of time where he could develop as an officer a little bit more before being sort of thrust into this command position. Uh, and in the, the Sims, especially around the, the transition time uh, for it, I, I think it definitely shows that it was not something that he was particularly confident about. It was not something that he felt fully prepared for or really knew entirely how to wrap his hands. And it's still something that he struggles with as a character in a, in a recent sim where he was given command of the ship. He was frustrated by that role more than some people who would be elated by it to be, you know, finally be in the big chair. Oh, isn't this such a great time? He was frustrated. He he wanted to be back in the engine room. He wanted to be turning a screwdriver and putting his hands on things. And he was suddenly in this detached command position where he had to make big picture strategic decisions and see other people play them out and play the waiting game and deal with the, the tension and the stress and the pressure of what was now on his shoulders and all of those things were certainly not. And uh, especially considering the, the age of the character at this point were not things I expected uh, Teller to have to deal with at this kind of point in his career. Uh, and it's always something that I've tried to keep in mind when I'm writing for him, that he's still a young guy. He's had a lot of really strong experiences since he left the Academy but this is still his first posting. He's, he basically had one boss for like three weeks and then he was the head of a department and he's kind of been figuring it out since then kind of on the fly. Uh, and I, I try to remember that when I'm writing for him. that's part of, he shouldn't be perfect. He, he shouldn't know everything or know how to handle it. And some of the things that he does are probably not what a more experienced officer would approach things as, but they're what he came up with. So now that he is a department head, how, when you're approaching, because now you actually have other players that are subordinate to the character, um, how do you have Teller approach them, both in character and out of character? Uh, curious uh, t uh tellers well it's it's interesting because the the first subordinate that teller got uh is will you who joined about who joined almost at exactly the same time that he got the the acting chief promotion and because of that they've always acted much more like equals than ever b b like a, a boss and a subordinate and that to to my point before about that's probably not what a more experienced officer would have done. That's part of the fact that he's a young guy and he's still kind of finding his way in things. And he wasn't comfortable uh, flaunting his authority at that point in his career. He wasn't wasn't really going to be bossing people around or you know tossing orders left and right. 
Um, now that it's been some months since then, and uh, I actually have a new uh, or, uh, a young woman named, uh, I believe it's Charlena Vanleth? Yeah, Vanleth. Uh, Vanleth. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about how his approach to her will probably be different. Um, it'll certainly still be uh, a very friendly and less, um, you know, subordinate boss kind of relationship. But I do think he's going to. It, there's going to be more distance between those two than there is between, say, Teller and Will, because mm-hmm. I think he's come along a little bit more as an officer. He's seen kind of some of the hard side of being an officer and of making tough calls. And he's also seen where sometimes he's had to give orders that other people have not been thrilled about. And it's important to maintain that uh, chain of command. It, it, it keeps the ship going. Yeah, actually uh, that brings up a, a great scene that you had with a uh, other new end going the Veritas. Saeed. Oh, uh, it's in uh, El Said. Yes, um, which is a great. You know, you were talking about or about sometimes new writers feeling not sure if they want to show their characters being nervous or whatever. Uh, you know, another thing sometimes that I see with they're worried about they're showing confrontation, but Ensign El Said was pretty, pretty bold. And yeah, bad. not not <laughs> a problem that for she, that ensign. <laughs> yeah, that she was not happy with uh, Teller's. He wasn't the ultimate decision maker, but Teller certainly had a plan. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's somewhat of a rough joke Veritas about uh, his plans. And his his demolitionist uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> tendencies. Which, which, because we're talking out of character here on the podcast, I will say to Teller's defense that he, <laughs> this is going to be horrible because he's just following orders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that doesn't that doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound bad at all, right? No. Anyway, um, but yeah, so you had this great scene uh, with uh, Ensign Al Said, and I don't know if you talked to her writer much out of character, but I hope because it was one thing I saw. Um, you guys had a scene afterward where you're kind of like, "Well, hey, get to talk about it or something like that." Um, Mm-hmm. I hope you guys don't immediately, uh, although it's st- still Star Trek and it's important that we do show people working as a team and all that, but I think it's good to kind of explore that because to give a quick summary for people who weren't on our ship, basically we were battling this ancient alien AI and uh, El Sayed is a science officer. The way team was at uh, a uh, archaeological site, basically. Uh, and Teller is like, well, we need to neutralize the threat. And the best way to do it is to destroy it. Because, of course, at the time, the Veritas is in a space battle. He's, like you said, he was actually in command of the Veritas during an earlier battle, so he's seen the devastation that AI can have on have on people and, and actually hurting people, killing people. Uh, so he's like, we had to neutralize this threat now, right? And uh, Al Said is thinking that there's got to be a, another way. And that, that's actually a great kind of uh, Star Trek moral dilemma to have, right? And in this case, uh, Teller's solution was that his superiors went with Kelrod and Juan. Uh, so I hope you guys kind of explore that a little bit, maybe uh, even whether between yourselves or maybe if the talks to the council or so on and so forth. You know, it's, uh, it, it's interesting that you bring it up because it, it's an excellent example of, you know, we're talking about Star Trek moments and one of the, one of the best things, especially, uh, I mean, this was heavily explored in the original series and then even more built upon in next generation was you could establish philosophical conflicts between officers that both had valid points of view. And then it fell on the superior officers to choose between no clear winner, no, you know, no, oh, this is obviously better 
obviously the the right path this is the the best decision that there's only not great decisions or only imperfect solutions but because time is running out life is on the line we're the only ship in the area well the, the that that captain or that first officer has to make that decision and then deal with the ramifications of it. But yeah. and, and like you would say, I would say also that nobody is necessarily the bad person or the wrong person or a jerk or whatever for having that differing opinion. Right. Exactly, and I think that's important. Like it, it's something that should set two characters apart is that they don't always agree on things. They do. They don't need to agree on things. There's a reason that Teller's an engineer and that Nabitha El Sayed is a scientist. There are. They have a different worldview. They they prioritize different things, and that's important. You know, not just based on their ranks and their positions, but they're different people, and they should be allowed to be. And having separate opinions on having separate but equally valid viewpoints on a situation, I think, is a great way of establishing the distance between characters because it allows for discussion. It, it allows for the kind of back and forth that you would get between Spock and Bones or that you could get between, you know, uh, Worf and man. Data, you know. Well, I was, I was going to say, yeah. absolutely. What or Worf and Troy? You know, yeah, exactly. where yeah. you know you, you have diametrically posed viewpoints, but ones that are both valid and yeah. all that speak to the broader philosophy of Star Trek and Starfleet. Of well, we're explorers, but also we're trying not to get killed. So sometimes we need to defend ourselves, but it would be nice if we could do that without, you know, messing up the cool stuff that's trying to kill us. But sometimes we can't. That's like the ultimate uh, paradox of Starfleet, isn't it? Right. Because they're explorers and yet, they have a lot of guns on these (laughs) exploratory craft. Well, it's the ultimate observers paradox, really. Oh yeah. Yeah. They can't observe anything without directly. With but, a, yeah, yeah, like the the fact that they have this prime directive, but you know, of course, just by observing, just by going out and exploring, you are interfering. Right, and the ultimate extension of the prime directive would be every. And you know, wh- wh- why bother going out into space and if your primary motivation is that you are not going to get involved, but. As we all know, the, some of the most interesting stories in Star Trek lore are either when that directive is put aside or when that directive is put to a test. Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, you know, whether it's the prime directive or it's just Starfleet's dual nature as the territory arm of the Federation and also its defensive arm, uh, that's when you get, you see this conflict, that's when you get a lot of great drama. Absolutely. Well, yeah. And, you know, between ca- and, and their, you know, perfect example, characters with oppositional viewpoints and mm-hmm. how those conflicts are resolved are some of the best examples of storytelling in the show. Definitely. Well, let me uh, wrap this up by asking again with your character, maybe some like future plans that you have. I know a lot of times we spoil it for um, the fellow audience and so forth. So, maybe as much detail as you want, tell us, or just even things that you'd like to see maybe with the character. Uh, you know, what's something that you would like to see? Let's not say long-term. Let's just say maybe within a year from now, what would you like to see Teller, you know, sure. go from uh, where he is now? To that? I mean, the, uh, some, of the, some of the smaller <laughs> I'd like to explore with Teller are him kind of settling into uh, a more seasoned officer persona um you know both in gaining a little bit more confidence with some of the heavier decisions and the ramifications of them Uh, i'm actually exploring a sim right now where he's dealing with uh the death of someone under his command for the first time and how that 
is going to affect him as a person and as an officer, especially with the uh, with the kind of baggage of some of the the issues that that his character has with the loss of family and how how deeply that that has shaped him as a person uh aside from that um I, there's some of the fun sides of the character that i'd really like to explore that um during a, a shore leave a couple of months ago two other writers and i uh ended up creating this truly uh, w- w- uh, something we're all very proud of called the Bolian Rose arc uh, that was uh, truly kind of massive. And in the course of which uh, Teller developed a uh, pirate alternate persona for the purposes of, of getting them out of a very bad situation. And at the time it was purely intended as a bluff as something that would be a quick throwaway, And that was it. And we all had so much fun doing it that we sort of mutually decided after the fact. And as, as we were kind of writing through the sim that we need to find some way to keep that in there and maybe have some fun with it further on down the road. So I'm, uh, I'm expecting that his, pirate persona is going to pop back up at, at some point and uh, it will cause probably nothing but trouble for him, but it should be a good time. Oh, definitely trouble for him and his captain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I did say that was the last question, but I actually do have one more question for you. Will I? Sure. What's something about Jeffrey Teller that we don't know that uh, other people don't know your shipmates or other people in the fleet. Uh, how about, for example, you were, we were talking before this recording about you have a reference from his name. That it oh, yeah. Uh, so in the in the wiki, his full name is Jeffrey John Teller, and uh, it's shortened to in the in the wiki at least GJ, which because his nickname was uh, Good Job because he was a uh, he was a plasma welder prior to uh, joining the fleet. Uh, what most people don't know is that I based the name originally uh, on a character from Sons of Anarchy, who uh, is a, a biker in it. Uh, John Teller is famously the father of Jax Teller, the main character, and died off screen before the uh, the beginning of the show. But I always thought the name had kind of a, a, a good sound to it. And it was a show that I was watching when I originally joined uh, 118 last year. And as I, I kind of had typed the name out as I was as I was working on my original bio and I'm like, nah, I don't want to do just John Teller. That seems a little too on the nose. And I, I built to Jeffrey somehow, but I decided to leave John in the reminder of where the character. <laughs> well, so maybe, then, so maybe Teller has a motorcycle. somewhere. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's why we keep those uh, backstories nice and open. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much, Brian, uh, for talking to me today. Yeah, my and, pleasure. Yeah. For those of you who want to read some of uh, Brian's excellent sims as Mr. Teller, you can check out the Veritas archives. Uh, and I think if your sims have made it, appreciations. But, uh, yes, uh, I, we've, we've actually been lucky enough to get nominated. Since its founding in 1994, Starbase 118 has had a long and illustrious history as the oldest, longest-running Star Trek-based RPG on the internet. This community of writers has left an indelible mark on the universe that is so fond and beloved to so many. Over the last 25 years, there have been many who have left the mark on this community originally started by Admiral Wolf. Recently, however, I had the honor of interviewing one such individual who has left a legacy of her own in this wonderful community, Rear Admiral Tony Turner. How long have you been a member of SB-118? She says, I joined our group in September of 2005 and never looked back. Nothing pleases me more than to wake up in the morning and find new sims to answer. You write for Rear Admiral Tony Turner. Was she your first character? Yes and no. I started the academy training as Terry Turner, but a day later I lost my mother. And by the end of the two-week class, I'd forgotten the first name and ended up graduating as Tony. 
Admiral Turner has had an eventful career as well as some heartbreaking romantic experiences. What, from a writing standpoint, has been among your most memorable or beloved moments in your time playing her? She laughs. I suppose that, despite the heartbreaks, that young love brings out the best romantic feelings. I always cherish the writing between Tony and Heath West. It was a challenge trying to keep our descriptions within the PG-13 range, and some of it may have sounded corny. Ergo, the smile he put on her face when he entered the room deep in the dimples in her cheeks. But it was fun to accomplish. You are currently in command of the embassy on Doronis II. From your perspective, how does commanding the embassy differ from commanding a, uh, a starship or a station? To me, the embassy offers the best of two worlds. In space, and the heartwarming feeling of having a home. That's not to say that the planet is always peaceful. There are always elements from neighboring species, members of the world of crime, and sometimes the Lodiums themselves that wreak havoc. What are some of the challenges you've had to overcome, if any, in commanding a static duty post? How much does having the USS Thor and USS Thunder A at your disposal help when it comes to keeping the crew and your fellow writers engaged? From day one, we had players assigned to the embassy expecting the stories to be bland and craving the action of being on a ship. They didn't stay long. The challenge has been to create that best of two worlds persona and show it to them the right way. Could you tell us a little bit about the embassy? It's place in the fleet, a little bit about its history and such, I see. Wow. I suppose the best way to start is saying that the embassy is the longest uh, lasting facility or ship under the same command, and I owe that to some forward-thinking SB-118 members who created the embassy and the Laudian species. They didn't miss any detail, making it a home away from home. You see, I joined the embassy straight out of the academy, happy to be there, but soon found that the Laudians was cast as a warring species, which limited players' creativity. After a few months, I became frustrated and transferred to the USS Challenger. By the time I became captain, the embassy had been abandoned, but Admiral Wolf put a message on the forums asking if anyone wanted it. I was the only one who answered the call, believing that there were more stories to tell about the relationship between the Laudians and the embassy. Luckily, I was right, because for nearly 10 years, we've completed at least six missions per year. What's your favorite PNPC or mission-specific PNPC you've either simmed with or as in your time with Starbase 118? Marine Captain Hella, a Boslik, call sign Banshee, is my favorite PNPC because she is the total opposite of Tony. While Tony is mild-mannered, Hella doesn't care if anyone likes her or not. Her, quote, special assignment status opens the door to covert actions that put her infiltrating behind enemy lines. What's the funniest sim or moment you can recall since you started? It's hard to choose just one, but any time I simmed with Lieutenant Commander Talea was always fun. She played Tony's best sim friend, but we always ended up with good-humored insults to each other. Of all those sims, the one that stands out was the havoc of Talea delivering Tony's first son. What legacy do you hope to leave to either leave either in regards to the embassy or 118 as a whole. The legacy I would hope to leave would be the longest lasting station in the fleet under one command and hope that someone would step up after I'm gone to continue that legacy. For the Starbase 118 fleet, I would hope that in some way I would have helped it continue for many more years as the best and most creative sim on the internet. You've participated in at least one summer blockbuster the fleet encompassing story arcs that have been done several times in years past. What are those like? Any fond memories of one in particular? Summer blockbusters were fun, but they took a good deal of scheduling to make them work with our other missions. What's the most entertaining or surprising plot twist that you've either seen or come up with? Well, we have not had one that didn't have some kind of plot twist that made it entertaining or surprising and it's all due to the imaginations of the players. While it can be a bit of a logistical strain, with so many members of 118 now, have there been many joint missions between the Embassy and other crews from the fleet recently? Any plans to have one in the future? 
We've had one joint mission so far at the embassy. The planet, Talon, was infested with bluegill, but that was the mission that Tony's second husband, Commander Talus Rule, was killed, and it ended on a sad note that was difficult to write, especially telling the children of his demise. Uh, the reason he left the embassy is that he had become a captain with his own ship and changed his name to Captain Herrera. Given how many wonderful new cadets graduate from the academy, do you have any wisdom to impart to your fellow simmers, new or old? The best way to sim your character is to be yourself as a writer, no matter the species. In doing that, your sims will flow better. What's been your most beloved duty post? Why? CMO, Chief Medical Officer, was by far my most beloved duty post because it gave me the opportunity to use my creativity to the fullest. I did a lot of research into the latest medical procedures, then added what I thought they were like in the fleet's timeline. I, of course, had to ask this question. Kirk or Picard? Kirk, although he was silly at times, he always showed his human side. You've won several accolades in regards to your wiki bio. Any advice you'd like to share with anyone looking to spice up or otherwise fill their bio more? Granted, you've got a lot more actual IC experiences to draw on. Record everything you have time to add, and treat your character with every aspect of his or her life as any species you have chosen. Uh, what advice would you like to impart to anyone seeking to advance to the Admiralty, or even to Captain? Follow your dreams, and make them happen with hard work and dedication to the fleet. Mine was to return to the Embassy at the CO. Do you have any funny anecdotes from your time with 118? Any about our illustrious Wolf? Well, Admiral Wolf doesn't have much time for humor. He's always busy making simming easier and taking care of the problems that arise. His focus is on making uh, Starbase 118 a creative environment for the players. In closing, could you give us a little insight into what might be in store for the Embassy in the future? Every new crew member brings creativity that inspires both old and new players, so it's difficult to say what happens next, but I'm sure the missions will always be fun to write. This year marks the 25th anniversary of Starbase 118. No small feat, and a testament to this wonderful community we're all a part of. The legacy started by Admiral Wolf continues with each and every one of us. I'd like to thank Admiral Turner for her participation and hope her legacy endures for many years to come. I'd also like to thank every member of Starbase 118 for their continued contributions to this community of ours. In the words of Jonathan Franks, go boldly. Our July Fleet Chat. Join us in the chat room for our monthly out-of-character chat on Sunday, July 13th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. London, 4 a.m. plus 1 Sydney time. Interested parties can visit worldtimebuddy.com to see when the chat will take place in their time zone. Yes, 
pray the skies are starry and the stars are starry sea. I will serve, I will ride, chase my dreams and please the light. I will ride, chase my dreams and please the light. Reach the light.